All right, folks, so hello and welcome uh, to the first part of our Intro to Kubernetes class. Oh, I should probably share my screen. That would be helpful. There we go. Um, today, our goal is going to be to get Kubernetes installed on some environment, ideally on your machine. Um, if you're on Windows, we're going to be doing this with WSL, uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux. Uh, if you, For people viewing this later, uh, you will need to install WSL. There's really good tutorials on it, and it should work pretty clearly. And for the people that it didn't work clearly, they're figuring it out pretty well. So, um, Also, it helps if Windows Update has already been run a bunch. Uh, for those of you on Mac, uh, we have to do a little bit of extra work, but that's all right. Uh, we're going to walk you through it. So let's let's dive in. Uh, quick disclaimer, I am not an expert. I am definitely not an expert on this. Uh, Kubernetes is hard. Um, but uh, I will share with you what I do know and what I have used in a work setting. Um, and I will include references to various tutorials and stuff that I use to build this tutorial that I'm sharing with you guys. Um, so today uh, we're going to start with environment preparation uh, for people on Mac because there are some operations that could take a very long time. And in that case, we should, we should get them started now so they can run in the background throughout the presentation. And then they should finish by the time we need to do stuff. So we'll start with that. Following that, we'll dive into the actual uh, workshop itself. Uh, we'll, we'll review what problems does Docker create, specifically the problems of running Docker in a cluster. Uh, and then we'll go over what exactly Kubernetes is, um, followed by um, how, what, how does Kubernetes solve the problems uh, of Docker running as a cluster. And then we'll end up with setting up Kubernetes itself and doing a whole bunch of fun command line stuff. Uh, any questions? No. Cool. Um, so again, today we will be doing setup of Kubernetes. And then for part two, we will do actually doing stuff in Kubernetes, like deploying applications and setting auto scaling and all that kind of stuff. So let's get moving. All right. For you WSL, for you WSL folks, you get to mostly chill. You, you should be ready to go as is. Um, for folks on Mac, we have some work to do, so let's do it together. Uh, alternatively, if you were not able to get WSL to work on Windows for whatever reason, uh, these instructions also work on Windows, and I'm going to follow them with you on Windows. Um, so uh, also, oh, uh, Anker, did you install Vagrant? Uh, no. Crap. You can continue, like I'll follow along. OK. Um, how about this? Uh, I have a virtual machine on AWS for you. Um, and I can just give you the SSH key for that. And then you can do it there. Does that work? I'll just follow along. Oh, I guess. Okay. Well, in case you change your mind, yeah. here's, here's a here is the username and IP and a link to the public key. I don't know if that actually clicked the right file. Oh, God. Come on. There we go. Let's grab this. Share. Share with anyone with the link, because we're going to delete it after this class anyway. And uh, yeah. So if you download the private key at that link, and if you SSH using that user at that host name, you'll have an Ubuntu instance that you can do stuff with. Uh, however, for people who will be following this recording later on, uh, we're just going to run through this very briefly. Um, so you should install Vagrant and uh, VirtualBox, which is missing from this presentation, but I will add uh, if you're going to follow along this way. And then you should make a folder to do your work in. Um, following that, uh, oh, so Vagrant, if you're not familiar, this is also useful for everyone here. Vagrant is a tool for running virtual machines. 
So you know how we have Docker files to run Docker containers and build Docker images? Uh, Vagrant is a very similar thing, uh, where you have a Vagrant file that defines attributes of some virtual image along with configuration and startup settings and all these kinds of things. Um, and it's a great way to share virtual machine configurations. Uh, so if you ever need to manage virtual machines, or for example, if you have to do like at my company, we were going to do an on-premise deployment. Uh, I set up a Vagrant file with three different virtual machines and deployed Kubernetes as a cluster to the three different virtual machines. Um, and we're actually going to do that here. Um, and it'll be great. So uh, you run Vagrant init, and then the type of virtual machine you want to run, in this case, Ubuntu Focal 64. Focal is um, the latest long-term support version of Ubuntu. Um, and then once that finishes, you'll run Vagrant up to, ooh, you know what? That's actually out of order. I need to fix that. Um, before you run Vagrant up, um, uh, running the Vagrant init will create a Vagrant file in the folder that you set up. Uh, you want to look for this section, and you want to uncomment it. This is basically the memory configuration. Uh, Kubernetes requires at least two gigs of memory. OK, so be aware of that. Um, and the, the virtual machine I set up for your Anker does have two gigs of memory, so you should be fine. Um, so you want to basically change the configuration to use two gigs of memory. And then you also want to change the network config uh, because we're going to use port 8001. So you need to set that up as a forwarded port from your host machine, your physical computer, to the virtual machine, the guest. Um, and you can just set 8001 for both. Once you've done that, then you can run Vagrant up uh, and it will take some time. Uh, it'll ask you which interface to use. Um, and you should choose whichever interface you use to connect to the internet. And then if you've done that, uh, just run Vagrant SSH to SSH into your virtual machine. Um, use IP route to get an IP address. Um, you want to look for a 192 or 10.0 IP address after SRC. And then you can just copy and paste this block of stuff to install Docker. Um, and that's it for Vagrant people. Are you OK, Anker? Can you share me the SSH command? I'm actually not remembering that. Not a problem. Uh, it depends on where you downloaded your pem file to. Uh, yeah. You want to do something it's in like my yeah. Downloads downloads folder. It's in my okay. downloads folder. Cool. Then you can do something like uh, what did I name the file? Sorry, one moment. Uh, that should be it. Oh, um, you might need to wait, 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 wait. Before that, you might need to set the permissions. Is it 600 or 400? Let me check. What the hell? There we go. Oops. It is 600. Uh, so you want to do chmod 600. So you want to run them in the reverse order of the two messages that I sent. Thank you. Yep. Um, oh, do I want to do this WSL or do I want to do it Vagrant? Let's do it WSL since we have two people here doing WSL. All right. So, and let me. So if so, uh, Josie and Juno, um, you guys want to open up WSL? It should look something like this. It'll put you in your Windows home user directory, but screw that. We're in Linux land. Just do CD enter, and it'll toss you into your uh, Linux home directory for your WSL Linux distribution. So just do that. Keep that in the background. We'll come back to it later. All good? Yep. Cool. All right. So 15 minutes in, and we're good. Now. Um, so on to the actual contents of the presentation. So running Docker in a cluster is, is not fun. First off, because alone it's not possible, or at least that's not entirely true. Alone, it's not reasonable. <laughs> um, first off, Docker Compose does not work across hosts. Um, and so 
they create a Docker Swarm, which does solve the clustering problem, just not very well. Um, which, I mean, maybe that's not entirely fair. But Docker Compose only sets up configuring Docker across multiple hosts. It doesn't solve a lot of the problems that we're going to talk about next. So Docker Swarm's like, hey, cool, you can deploy Docker on or Docker containers on all these different hosts. But then for all the other problems, you're on your own to solve them, which some people like that because then they have more control over how stuff gets done. But it's way too much work. I, I, I did it at my last, or rather someone at my company, at my last company did it and I helped them and it was very not fun. Junu can vouch for that. That would that sucked. That was not a good time. Um, so Kubernetes is the go-to solution for this kind of thing. Uh, so first off, Docker doesn't scale automatically. So let's say you have a cluster, and maybe your authentication service has almost no traffic, but your web server is absolutely getting hammered. You may want to scale down your auth service and scale up your web server, but Docker's not going to do that for you. You need some sort of clustering solution to do that for you. Additionally, when you're deploying containers without something like Docker Compose, read as Docker Swarm, um, they have no way to find each other automatically, right? Because when you deploy, let's say you're deploying to a cluster and you just say to the cluster, hey, give me a Docker container, you don't necessarily know where it's going to end up unless you're doing it manually. And if your containers can move across machines, which they sometimes can, you don't have a way of knowing where it went without some sort of um, service discovery, which we're going to talk about in a bit. Uh, there's also secret management. If you want your Docker containers to have secrets, what you have to do is basically mount them as a volume when you start the container. Uh, so that means you have to set your secret on each host in the cluster, and that's just more maintenance to do, right? You need another mechanism to manage your configurations across all these hosts. There's also no intelligent load balancing. Let's say you... Um, deploy a Docker service with three replicas, it's just going to like kind of random round robin it. Um, it's not exactly round robining, but um, it's still not, it's not intelligent load balancing. You're not going to get the most use out of your resources. And then just in general, clustering creates a lot of problems. When you solve one of these problems, you create one or two more. And uh, that's just not fun. So that's why Kubernetes exists. Um, you'll see Kubernetes often abbreviated to K8S. Uh, I was actually one, I, I wondered about why it was called K8S for short until I made this presentation and then I figured it out. It's K, eight letters, and then S, which is wonderfully lazy. Um, and it means helmsman, which is why like you have the ship uh, wheel logo thing. Um, so it's an orchestration platform. Orchestration is a big giant word with a big giant meaning. It basically means managing stuff across a cluster and solving all the problems that clustering things creates. Um, or maybe not all of them, but at least some portion of them. So like Zookeeper, I believe. Actually, Zookeeper, Zookeeper might just be a scheduler. I'm not sure if it's a scheduler or an orchestrator. I don't know much about Zookeeper, but um, orchestration is a big giant problem to solve. Um, and Kubernetes is a platform for doing this for you. And then some copy pasta from the Kubernetes website. It's portable, it's sensible, open source, and uh, it supports configuration and automation. So you don't have to worry about stuff. For example, at my company, we have our system deployed on Kubernetes and between our CI CD system plus Kubernetes, we just, uh, push a git tag, and then production gets redeployed, and there's no downtime for users. All we do is push a git tag, and it's done. And Kubernetes allows you to do cool stuff like that with an additional tool like CI CD. Um, and basically, it just solves the problems of deploying Docker in a cluster. Does anyone have questions so far? What are these controllers in Kubernetes? Oh, there is. Oh, geez, sorry, I wasn't looking at the chat. Uh, service discovery, when you were when I was talking about Docker, can, oh, you're asking what service discovery is? I'm going to cover that in, in a couple minutes. No, I know service discovery. I oh, OK. Of that. Gotcha. Yeah, so the whole finding containers thing, yeah. 
Um, there yeah. is K3S. That's a good point. Um, but K3S, I think, is a is kind of a mini version of Kubernetes. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Lightweight. Yeah. Um, and when you're saying what are these controllers, are you talking about like an actual controller in Kubernetes or something else? Yeah. Okay. The Kubernetes controller. Uh, we are going to talk about that in a few more slides. So we'll get there. Sure. But good question. Cool. Any other questions before you go forward? Cool. Also, uh, controller is kind of an overloaded word. It has multiple meanings, even within Kubernetes. But I'll address that when we get there. So um, getting into what Kubernetes actually is, because that's kind of like what Kubernetes does, but what is it? It's a whole bunch of different software that works together. And we're going to go through each of those different pieces of software. The, the different pieces can be grouped into two categories. Uh, the control plane, which is the part that kind of, the, the part that's basically the brain of Kubernetes and allows the different physical hosts or virtual for all that matter, the different hosts in the cluster to actually talk to each other. Um, and then the worker nodes, which is where your application containers will actually run. Um, so the control plane, we'll start with the control plane and then we'll talk about the worker nodes. Um, and Usually, when you set up Kubernetes, you want your control plane to, to be dedicated and separated from your app containers. Now, what we're going to do today, we're actually going to have them on the same host. Um, but the reason you want to separate them is because, let's say something goes terribly, terribly wrong with your app that you deployed to Kubernetes, and it somehow, now this, this really shouldn't happen, but anything is possible. Um, let's say somehow your app takes down the node that it's living on. I've, I've never seen that happen, but in theory, it's a thing. Um, if that app is on the same node as the control plane, your whole cluster is down rather than just the one node. So you generally want to separate the apps from the control plane just for safety. Um, additionally, it prevents the control node and the, or the, um, the control plane controllers uh, from competing with the apps for resources. And if you configure your resource management well, that shouldn't be a problem. But again, mistakes happen, anything's possible. It's just better to keep them separate. Um, so that said, let's dive into the control plane and the workers uh, individually. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, both the control plane and the workers are made of several components. Uh, what you're going to work with the most uh, in a Kubernetes deployment is probably the Kube API server. And that is basically a gateway API to allow some consumer, like a Kubernetes administrator, such as yourselves, by the end of this, uh, to do stuff with the Kubernetes cluster, like deploy containers or define services or more, 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 more. So that's kind of the entry point to doing things in uh, the cluster. Kubernetes also comes with etcd. Etcd is, whoa, what, what, that keeps happening. For some reason, it keeps skipping, um, going back a slide without me touching anything. Um, so etcd is a key value store um, that uses both memory and disk for fast retrieval of data. Um, and Kubernetes uses that because it's a really good tool. Etcd is great. Um, then there's the kube scheduler. Uh, scheduling is basically just where to place a container. Um, because there are several different ways in Kubernetes that you can uh, tell it where to put a container. You can go, oh, put it on the node that's using the less, least resources, or put it on a node that has a GPU set up with it, or put it on a node that has this storage already allocated to it. So the scheduler handles deciding things like that. Um, Next up is the controller manager, which is now we're getting into the questions you were asking, Anker. Oh, I did it again. Is it Anker or Anker? I, am, I don't know how to say it. It's Anker. Anker, cool, thank you. Um, so the controller manager basically manages controllers and these controllers can do various things. Uh, 
like manage the actual nodes, the physical nodes of the cluster, handle jobs that you set up, handle endpoints for the different services to talk to, and handle authentication services like tokens and all that kind of stuff. Um, controllers can also take the form of um, uh, a very common controller is an ingress controller, which is a special pod that gets, or set of pods that gets deployed to a cluster that manages, allows, and configures external traffic coming into this into the cluster. You know, like API traffic or web traffic or whatever. Um, so controllers manage things like that. For example. In AWS, they have the AWS Load Balancer controller, which is responsible for communicating with the AWS cloud to provision an AWS load balancer whenever it observes in the Kubernetes cluster an ingress resource being created. Um, so for those of you that know a little bit about Kubernetes already, um, that's how that works, in case you were curious. And if you don't know what the hell all that was, don't worry, you'll understand by the end of part two. <laughs> um, oh, actually, I'm sorry. That AWS example would actually be part of the cloud controller manager, not the cube controller manager, my mistake. The cloud controller manager, uh, basically, because because Kubernetes is often deployed to cloud systems, um, they have a dedicated controller manager for interacting with the external cloud systems. When I say external, I mean external to the cluster. Why does this keep changing? Um, so this is things like request the cloud provider to provide a new EC2 instance or a new um, GCP VM or an Azure instance or whatever, um, or network configurations to allow different nodes to talk to each other, these kinds of things, or provision a load balancer, all that. And any questions about the control plane components so far, or does that make sense? So is that etcd different from control plane, like it's deployed separately? Uh -huh. So all of these different components are parts of the control plane. The control plane is really just a category of components. And these components make up the control plane. Sure. Cool. So yeah, basically these are the part that these are the parts that make the cluster work. If you have these, you have a cluster. If you don't have any workers, the cluster really isn't going to do anything. But if you have these, you theoretically have a Kubernetes cluster with a control plane. Now, fortunately, you don't have to deploy and configure all these by hand all the time. In a fully scaling, like world scope deployment, you would want to configure all these individually. But if you're just doing kind of basic stuff, or you don't have a huge amount of traffic, or you don't need any crazy requirements, you can automate most of this, and that's what we're going to do today. So moving on from the control, or any other questions before going forward? Cool. Nope. Uh, all right. So moving on to the worker nodes. Worker nodes are much simpler because they just do work. Um, so it's, it's composed of three parts. Uh, the main part is the kubelet. The kubelet is basically what communicates with the control plane um, to get containers onto the worker nodes. That's the kubelet is the main thing. A lot of times if you're Googling online for troubleshooting Kubernetes issues, you'll hear people talking about the kubelet. That's this thing. That's kind of the, the, the core of what gets your containers running. And then next up is the kube proxy, which manages uh, communication between containers. Um, because of weird stuff like DNS, or basically for things like service discovery and all that, um, Kube Proxy just manages all the really complicated networking stuff. Networking with Docker is just a damn nightmare. Um, again, Juno can attest to that. We had some really funky behavior um, at our last company. And just having Kube Proxy manage it for you just makes life way easier. Um, and then lastly is your actual container runtime. Uh, do note, oh, the container runtime is basically just what's running the containers. Now, these days, um, you know, we all talk about Docker, right? Docker is how we run containers. Docker is containers, right? Um, that's not the only container runtime. And 
that may sound weird to you because you might be like, everyone uses Docker though. Well, yes, everyone uses Docker, but Docker is also an interface. It's both an interface and a container runtime. So these days, what's happening is Kubernetes is actually deprecating the Docker, run the Docker container runtime in favor of the container D runtime. Now that doesn't mean you need to stop using Docker or need to freak out or anything. All that means is that the backend running your containers is container D rather than Docker, but it is 100%, well, mm, actually I don't know container D too well, but for normal usage, Docker and container D are compatible. So your Docker interface, like when you do Docker PS or whatever, or if you have a Docker image, it'll work fine with container D, so, so don't freak out. Um, there's also cryo. I don't know what that is. I just saw it mentioned a lot, <laughs> but I just thought I'd toss it there in case uh, anyone comes across it. These are options. So what we're going to do today is when we set up our container runtime, we're actually going to use container D since the Docker runtime is being deprecated. And that's how things are gonna be moving forward. But again, you can still use Docker to interface with it. So don't, don't freak out. Any questions about the worker nodes? Cool. All right. Now, you don't have to memorize all this stuff that I just told you. You just need to kind of recognize it because if you ever have Kubernetes problems, you're gonna you're gonna Google for like, oh, I have this error. Kube Kubelet could not instantiate container due to not being able to contact the container runtime or something like that. Maybe that is an error that you get which actually sounds like a pretty reasonable error. <laughs> um, and you're not expected to remember exactly what Kubelet is, but you're like, oh yeah, Kubelet is something on the worker node. And then you can go Google about it and be like, oh, now I remember what that is. So you don't have to memorize everything and be able to like recall it on a whim. You just need to be a little familiar with it. Just be aware that it exists. All right, so don't feel like you have to go study and memorize all this shit like there's gonna be a test because no unless you're getting some sort of Kubernetes certification, in which case, yeah, maybe you need to memorize it, but cool. Moving forward. Ah, last part is add-ons because Kubernetes uh, does, Kubernetes has opinions about how to do most things, but for some things it still wants to give you options and flexibility uh, in case you want to do things differently. Why does it keep doing that? There we go. Um, now, uh, most of these add-ons are automatically included if you're using um, a Kubernetes uh, cloud-managed environment. For example, um, uh, Google Container Engine or Google Kubernetes Engine, they keep switching the name, um, or AWS Elastic Kubernetes Service, or I think Azure also has a managed Kubernetes, but I'm not sure because I haven't used Azure. Um, and I think even I think even Naver Cloud has a managed Kubernetes, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, but if you're deploying Kubernetes on premise, or if you're managing it yourself, uh, you will need to deploy these components. Uh, and we will do three of the five today. Okay. So pod networking. Yeah. What's up, Anker? What you got? I have just one question. So yeah. where does this Kubernetes sit? Like I have seen this with uh, bare metal also, like it's also used to deploy bare metals. So does it sit just above the hardware layer or below the application layer? Where does it sit in the whole architecture? Kubernetes acts as an abstraction layer between the hardware and the application layer. So once you have set up a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, you, when you deploy your app, you don't have to say, "Oh, I'm deploying it to this node." You just say, "Hey, Kubernetes, deploy this app for me," and then okay. Kubernetes does it. Um, in terms of where Kubernetes itself lives, it lives on the hardware. Like, for example, when you're setting up the control plane, you're installing the Kube API server daemon on some host. You're installing etcd on some host, right? Okay. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Good question, because I probably should have made that clear right at the beginning. So thank you for asking, because um, I failed to make that clear if you needed to ask. So thank you. Um, so when it comes to these add-ons, uh, Kubernetes does not decide 
for you how it's going to do pod networking. Because like I mentioned earlier, networking between Docker containers is a mess. And there's many different ways to do it. So you have to deploy your own pod networking if you're deploying on-premise. But fortunately, there's a lot of options for that, which we'll get to later. Um, you have to deploy DNS. Luckily, uh, the newest version of Kubernetes that I found actually deploys with DN and a DNS add-on included using the tool that we're using if you're not doing it like super by hand. Um, so fortunately, that's covered. And then a web UI uh, for kind of managing Kubernetes, which we will install today. So that you can kind of so that you guys can see like the result of your work, and then resource monitoring basically how much CPU and memory are my containers using. You need some add-on to do that, and then logging because logging is always an add-on. So um, these are the recommended add-ons. There's all sorts of other stuff too, but these are the most common, um, and we're going to do the first three out of these five today. Cool. So moving forward. How does Kubernetes solve these Docker problems? Um, and this is where we're going to talk about service discovery on Kerr. Um, so first off, these, these problems that I mentioned, they aren't just Docker problems. Uh, they're general clustering problems. Whether you're doing Docker or a virtual machine farm or anything else, you're going to have very similar problems. Like AWS solves a lot of these problems with their virtual machine platform. Um, but unfortunately, the solutions are pretty common. Uh, so first off is scheduling. Where do containers go? Right. We talked about scheduling earlier. Uh, next up is service discovery. So if, if Kubernetes is an abstraction layer between the hardware and the application, and you're just um, the, the application can end up on any piece of the hardware, and the applications need to talk to each other, how do they find each other? Um, service discovery does that for you. Uh, the basic idea of service discovery is that when a new service, when a new application is deployed, it registers with some manager. And it says, hey, I'm this application. Here is my IP address and port. And then the manager says, cool, I will remember that. And I will check to make sure that you're still alive. Um, and then when another service wants to talk to that service, it checks with the manager and says, hey, I'm trying to talk to this app. Can you tell me where it is? Um, and then the manager says, oh, yeah, the app registered with me from this IP address and this port. Go there. And the questioning app goes, OK, cool, and goes there. Done. That's service discovery in a nutshell. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but conceptually, that's it. And this allows you to basically deploy your apps wherever you want because they're always going to be able to find each other, because service discovery is going to manage it for you. Um, additionally, there's software-defined networking, uh, whereas software-defined, as opposed to normal networking, is normal networking, like I got an Ethernet cable and I'm plugging it in, right? Um, or I have some firewall that I have to log into and configure by hand when I want to make changes. Uh, software-defined networking is more like, hey, I have a system that when the state of my network changes, it communicates those changes to the network configuration and updates the configuration to just work. Right? So, oh, hey, this app got deployed on a new port that I don't have a firewall rule open for. I'm going to recognize that that app is on that port. I'm going to open up the firewall, firewall rule for it and allow communication. That's software-defined networking, very simply. Um, next is uh, configuration and secret management. Uh, basically, that's etcd. How do we store data? And then how do we make that data available to our applications? Uh, etcd does that for the cluster. Um, and then volume claims. Uh, volumes, uh, in this context, volume means storage, uh, specifically persistent storage, uh, storage going beyond the lifetime of a, of a container. For example, if you're running a database in Kubernetes and the container dies, the storage does not die. You don't lose your storage if the container dies. So you keep your storage, you set up a new container, you mount the volume to it, and you have your database like nothing happened. Um, but you need some system to manage that, especially because, again, you have multiple hosts. How, do, how does your storage get passed along? Uh, in a cloud system, this usually takes the form of some cloud-managed network storage that usually is pretty transparent. You just say, hey, 
I want this EBS volume, or I want this elastic block storage, this remote storage disk attached to my EC2 instance. And Amazon's like, cool, done. Here's, here's your volume. It's at this folder kind of thing, like all automatic. In terms of on-premise deployments, you're likely using some network attached storage, some NAS. Um, and so you need to set up some controller to manage the NAS for you. Um, and that's, again, going back to the controllers that Ankur was asking about. Um, so that has to be managed. Uh, and lastly, resource definitions. So when we're creating things like our application services or our storage services or new configurations, how do we create that stuff? Like, is it like a web page? Is it, do I entering things on command line? Do I have some file that I upload? Hint is the last one. Um, although the other ones are possible too. But Kubernetes does all of this. It does all of this for you. So you don't have to worry about the stuff. But knowing that Kubernetes does this helps you troubleshoot issues. Again, like I said before, you don't have to memorize each and every individual detail, but having some idea of how it works will help you when you're solving problems. So any questions about this? No. Cool. Uh, time nope. check. We're doing great on time. Cool. All right, then let's uh, let's continue. So let's actually do some stuff. You've been listening to me talk for too long. Um, we're going to create a cluster using a tool called Cube ADM and or Cube Administration Administer. I think that's what it stands for. But uh, Cube ADM basically takes setting up the control plane and the worker nodes and makes it super easy. Like seriously, it, it's after you prepare the fit, the host machine uh, for Kubernetes, it's just one line. It is, it is absolutely wonderful because setting up all those different control plane components is not fun if you're going to do it manually. Um, so get into your Linux environment, whether it's WSL or Vagrant. So like I asked you guys before to set up uh, WSL if you're on Windows. And... Um, and Ankur, hopefully, uh, if you're deciding to follow along, uh, you should be good on that EC2 instance. Yeah, it's working. Excellent. All right. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to install Cube ADM, Kubelet, and KubeCTL. Remember, Kubelet is part of the worker node. Uh, and since we're only doing a one, a single node cluster, uh, which is a bit of an oxymoron, um, we're going to go ahead and install the Kubelet here too. So kubeadm will set up the control plane, we'll install kubelet so that we can run services, and then kubectl is something you're going to use to interact with the cluster after it's up to actually do stuff. So we're gonna need kubectl to set up permissions for ourselves and to set up that web UI dashboard that I mentioned we'll be installing. Oh, along with you know setting up the pod networking because that's important. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's get to it. So first, we're going to install the tools we need. Oh, also, uh, these these links you're seeing in the presentation, uh, these links are kind of a more, I didn't touch anything, um, kind of a more detailed version of what we're doing here. So if you want to see the long form of what we're doing, you can just click those links. But Actually, someone um, people are like simultaneously accessing these slides. So someone is clicking some other slides. So that's why it's changing. Mm, that's not how it works though because for example if i oh yeah for example josie is actually on the next slide uh so our our sl our slide viewing is independent of each other um at least as far as i know maybe maybe i'm wrong maybe there's something that i don't know but yeah um or maybe no, that shouldn't matter. I don't know. You could be right. This was but... the first time I clicked on anything, so it wasn't me moving it before. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, I don't. I think I think it's something with um with my system because my mouse acts a little funky sometimes, and it's. I've it's actually a few downloaded years. it as PDF, so. Ah, that's probably a good idea. Me. Oh, maybe I should do that next time. Yeah, maybe I'll do that next time. Thank you, Ankur. Um. But yeah, so let's go ahead and set up Kubernetes. So to install all the stuff, I, I basically took everything and 
packaged it into this set of commands. Uh, but just to explain, this first command here basically gets Google's public key, so we can verify that we're that the thing we're installing is actually from Google, from someone we supposedly trust. Um, then uh, the Kubernetes stuff. Uh, again, Kubernetes was created by Google, if you're not, or at least primarily sponsored by Google, if you're not familiar. Um, we're going to set up the Kubernetes package repository on our Ubuntu instance uh, so that we can install Ubuntu packages from it. And then we're going to update our Ubuntu package repository so we can see all the latest packages and we're going to install these packages. And then this last part, this was actually new to me. Um, you wanna make sure that your kubelet and your control plane are not more than one minor version different from each other. Um, and the uh, kubelet cannot be newer than the control plane. So basically, the control plane has to be either one minor version newer or the same as the kubelet. So we can do this apt mark hold to basically lock the version of the package that we have installed on this computer. So later, if you do an apt get upgrade, you don't upgrade your uh, kubelet without upgrading your control plane and set everything on fire. <laughs> so you can basically just copy this command and pop open WSL and run it, if I could click properly. And if I could enter my password, I think that's it. We're going to find out. Nope. Crap. There we go. Okay, let's try running this all again. There we go. So updating our package repository. So I only ran this in Vagrant because I'm stupid. So hopefully we don't run into any funky issues here, but I anticipate we'll be okay because I checked, I did check about running Kubernetes in WSL and Microsoft was bragging about how easy it is. <laughs> So we're installing our stuff. Mm. What's up, Jess? Yeah, uh, I'm having issues with just copying and pasting the thing. It's not actually including the line breaks on mine. Oh, that's weird. Um, can you copy them one by line? Let's give it a go. OK, yeah, I know what it is. Cool. Well, good job uh, figuring it out. So now we have stuff installed. So if I do kubeadm, for example, I get the kubeadm output. If I do kubectl, I get kubectl output. Mine doesn't show anything. <laughs> oh boy. You want to share your screen real quick? Uh, we can, because it, it, I mean, I press enter and everything, it's just not doing anything. So I don't know what's going on. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, we, we, we have a we have a little bit of extra time, I think. What slide are we on? Oh yeah, we got we got a good bit of extra time, so Okay, let me just try one more time. Sure. How this might work. Ankur, are you okay? It's asking me a password. Password. Oh. Oh. You shouldn't need a password. Sudo should just work. Uh well, if you use sudo, then it will ask for a password, no? Uh, it depends on how you configured sudo. I believe the default Ubuntu installation on AWS does not um, mess with sudo things. Hold up. Uh, no, it doesn't ask for a, pa a password on sudo on the EC2 instance. OK, Beach, can I share my screen with you? Yes, you can. So this is what I like typed in the command line. Yep, that looks good. Uh, I don't, I'm not seeing your screen yet, Josie, but uh, what yeah. you pasted to me looks good, Anker. Um, did it all? Did it all run? And Josie, why um, do I not see your screen? There we go. Oh. Yeah, there is. So what happened up here was uh, I did not get the spacing. Yeah, that's so weird. Tried to run it again, and it didn't do anything. Yeah, do tried it. Tried to clear 
try to do it again. Nothing. Try so, to Josie, folders or anything. Um, yeah. if you scroll up a tiny bit, yeah. notice how when you ran the command, your prompt ends in a hash mark. Uh, now your prompt is ending in an arrow because it's thinking you're still entering the same command. Do a control C. Yeah. Control C. Okay. There you go. Now try entering each command line by line. There, right. there seems to be something weird about the way that I copied the new lines. Sorry about that. So this is one line, right? Oh, wait. You can't see. Like this? One? Yeah. There you go. So that worked. Okay. Ah. Okay. Next. Yeah, weird. Why didn't it work the first time? That's strange. All right, now let's watch this. I want to make sure that the Kubernetes package provider shows up, or package repository shows up. Uh, come on. Okay. Oh, where's, oh, there it is. Yeah, Kubernetes Xenio. Cool. All right. Oh, wait, did I give you the correct? Oh no, this is going to be, ooh, 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 ooh. Wait, ooh, crap. <laughs> Um, crap, crap, crap. Can you run this? This this is why you don't copy paste commands from the internet without checking them, boys and girls. Um, you might not be running Xenial. Oh no. <laughs> uh, what is it? Yeah. So I apologize, Josie. You're gonna want to rerun a couple of those. Oh, uh, you should change this to this okay where should i rerun from uh from the echo command forward okay i copy and paste that one try it again okay now it thinks i'm still in the same command uh hit enter one more time or wait no no uh crap control c yep <laughs> okay copy and paste again <laughs> Yep. Oh, 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 you're missing the last line is the problem. Ah, uh, there we go. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Right. Cool. That now do your apt get update, then your apt get install. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. I should have caught that. But I'm, I'm glad you had a problem, so we fixed it. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay, so it's the same build for both, uh, both versions. That's great. Okay, there we go. Cool. All right. Thank you, Josie. Unker, are, are you okay or are you still having issues? Yeah, it's working. Great. Good to hear. Whoa. How do I... Whatever, it doesn't matter. Cool. All right. Good job, folks. First hurdle passed. Um, so at this point, if you run, again, kubeadm or kubectl, you should see the help output. If you don't see that, start yelling and screaming at me like, Bead, you suck. Fix it. <laughs> Cool. Juno, were you able to get stuff working, or are you just going to stick to observing? You're still muted. Oh, I'm just going to be observing. OK, cool. Yeah. Um, cool. So moving forward, that gets our tools installed. Now we need to install the actual um, system. I'm sorry, not install the actual system. We're not installing Kubernetes yet. Uh, we need to prepare the system. So Kubernetes does not like swap. Does not like it. Does not want swap. If you don't know what swap is, uh, yeah, I can explain it super briefly. Um, normally, you have your memory, where your application data lives for the time that you're running it, and memory is really fast. But sometimes your, your memory is limited, right? You don't have infinite memory. You only have as much memory as you have RAM installed in your computer, and it's not a huge amount. So what your computer will do is uh, it'll, instead of keeping everything in RAM memory, some, it'll write some of that to disk to preserve your RAM memory space. Now, disk is slower than RAM. So when you read from the swap, it's going to be a bit slower. But it's better that you have a bit of a slow read rather than running out of memory and your system crashing. So that's why swap is a thing. However, Kubernetes does not like swap. So we are going to turn it off. Uh, you can do that by basically running, whoa, these, uh, f where's my where's my thing? Yeah. Um, so these first two commands here, um, disable your swap. 
So go ahead and run those. Whoa, those artifacts are weird. OK, so we're going to run those real quick. Let me make my window smaller here. So sudo swap off dash a sudo said I wait swap. This is a crazy regex. I don't know why I'm typing this by hand. <laughs> it's like a typing game, but more masochistic. I hope I typed that right. Yeah, I think I did. Um, so the first command disables swap for our current session. And then the second command disables swap if we ever restart the machine. Uh, and then following that, uh, I'm having a bit of a issue seeing your presentation, actually. It's not showing a starting yeah. view on my screen. Same here. Yeah. This is so weird. Not showing full screen. So you're... Oh, I have to resume screen. presenting. Sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> that was weird. Not sure how that worked, okay. but yeah. So these first two commands, again, the first one... Uh, disable swap for your currently running session. The second one, uh, disable swap if you restart the machine. And then this bottom portion here, which I'm not going to just copy paste, which I'm going to just copy paste. Uh, again, earlier we said that we're running container D. Ooh, ooh, I might have skipped a step. Um, Josie and Anker. Can you guys do me a favor and try running, just do Docker and tell me if it gives you an error? <laughs> I think we forgot to install Docker. Fortunately, it's pretty easy. Before but... or after doing sudo sed? It doesn't matter. Just do Docker? Yeah. Um, Not found? No, I have I have Docker here. Ooh, thank goodness. How about you, Anker? Not installed. Not installed? OK, cool. So. We're going to do that real quick, and I'm going to modify this presentation later. Uh, if you guys can pop, on, if you're running, if you're doing the presentation locally, if you can pop on over to slide seven. I don't know why I did that, because, uh, and basically just copy this whole block. And uh, yeah. And this should work with any um, Ubuntu version because the distro or the um, release name is not hard coded. <laughs> so, Ankur, you may need to run this very briefly. Uh, I think I set it up as Ubuntu version 20. Can you paste the command in the chat? Sure. Thanks. Uh, let me make sure that I'm pretty sure I set up the correct version. Where is the Ubuntu? I want to see the AMI. Yeah, Focal. Yeah, so it's running version 20. Um, oh, ooh, maybe I should update the. No, because this is for. Um, this is for Vagrant. So yeah, people should have this done already. Cool. And uh, Ankur, can you give me a heads up when you have that finished? It shouldn't take more than I'm a minute. I'm just doing that. Cool. Yeah. So then, um, then we just need to run these remaining commands. Oh, that's cool. Hmm. Yeah, you don't want to run those last two, Josie. They they bug out. 
Okay, uh, so just the count one. Yeah. Right. That's interesting. Uh, which two commands? Uh, th they'll work for you. It's a it's a WSL problem. Okay. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, you know what, Josie? Um, my version of WSL is a bit older, so maybe those last two commands will work for you. Try running them. Let me know if they give you an error or if they work. OK. Uh, yeah, error, error. Cool. I think this works now. That's not helpful. I'm going to try the well, mm? I'm going to try this. Nope. Well, we're going to run this and hopefully We're going to try it without, and we're going to see if it works. Because <laughs> these people are compiling their own kernel to fix the problem, and I have zero interest in doing that, especially within the scope of this class. So it says the config was updated. See commit in 2019. Oh, yeah, he this guy created a new kernel. Screw that. But they're saying the kernel has been available to the public for a while. Oh, there's an update package. I was not aware of this. Wait, Josie, this is the one you followed, right? Um, the uh, yeah, Windows yeah, I did the manual installation. I did that, so it should theoretically work on mine, and it's not. So, yeah, I did. I did this. That's concerning. Well, we'll see if it'll work without it. <laughs> Worst case, we know if we run into networking problems, we know where they came from. Um, that was easy. That has me concerned. Looks like it's OK. Let me go ahead and uh, fine, be that way. Sorry, give me just a second. I want to test something. Stupid fucking spaces and names of things. What are you talking about, dude? Oh. Oh. I hate you. <laughs> there we go. No? I'm going to start it myself now. Chill out. Okay. What? I just... Oh, damn it. All right. Oh, you're kidding me. <laughs> so 
for me, shall I? What did I do? Because mine didn't work. Um. Yep. Nope. That didn't fix it. Okay. Let's just uh yeah. let's just continue forward, and then if we run into networking issues, we know that's a problem. So move on to slide 18. Um, and basically run all these guys. This first one uh just configures networking to allow um bridge networks on both IPv4 and IPv6. And that should just work. Um, and then do we need to yeah? Do we need to paste all the commands from slide 17? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then uh so that the in slide 18, the first command uh configures uh your system with those networking configurations. The second command uh, basically tells the system, hey, apply these configurations now. So when you run that second command, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff. It's basically just printing what your current system configurations are. So don't don't freak out. Um, the third bit configures container D. Remember, I mentioned we're using the container D runtime, not the Docker runtime. Um, basically, we ask container D, hey, what are the default configs? I'm going to write those to my config file. And then we restart oh. container D. So super simple. <laughs> Mine says um, failed to con connect to bus. Host is down. That, that, OK, here says that. <laughs> cool. <sighs> cool. All right, then in our case, uh, we may not use container D with ours, Josie. Okay. We, we may just use normal Docker. So we're going to try that. Um, so in that case, Josie, skip the last step. OK. Actually, wait, wait, wait. Hold up. Yeah. Um, because we're running, hold up, mm. skip the below if running WSL. Um, so basically, to explain what's happening here, um, on WSL, we are not running container D. We're running raw Docker. Uh, additionally, uh, this last bit uh, tells Docker to use. So, so Ubuntu uses systemd to manage the system, hence system daemon being the name. Um, and this last one is basically telling Docker, hey, I'm using systemd. Let systemd manage you rather than you trying to manage. Um, C groups yourself. Um, but uh, WSL does not use systemd, even though it uses Ubuntu. So WSL folks are going to skip that last one. Uh, but Ankur, you do want to run all of this with your EC2 instance. Is that WSL also? The which stuff? Um, WSL? No, 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 no. Uh, you, you, I'm saying... Uh, slide 18. Yeah, this this whole slide eight. You will run all of slide 18. Okay, I've done that. Cool. All right, cool. But Josie, you and I are going to skip this, and we're going to hope for the best. <laughs> okay. Um. And uh, you're also going to follow the directions on uh, slide 19, Ankur. But Josie and I are not. Uh, except what I'm actually going to do is, in a separate project, or in a separate thing, I'm going to set up Vagrant so I can follow along with you. Because I was setting up Vagrant yesterday, and I had that all configured. How are we doing on time? We're doing pretty good on time. 
All right, cool. So I have Vagrant setting up in the background. So Unker, uh, let me know when you've finished uh, slide 19 as well, OK? Yeah. Basically, this is just telling container D, hey, we're using system D, just like we told Docker in the last slide. And I don't need to do anything. Correct, Josie. I'm going to check a couple things out, though. Ooh, this is gross. Oh, this is super gross. It's also not where we're looking. Oh, wait, yeah, it is. OK, if uh, Josie, if it doesn't work for us, I have an alternative. It's a bit, it's a bit messy, but yeah. Okay. But I still don't need to do anything right now. Right now, no. Uh, Ankur, did you get stuff finished? Um. I've actually found that thing, but the second thing, the system DC group equals to true. I'm not finding that. Yeah, we're we're adding it. So just below that, should I? Yes. Yes, this? sir. Yep, and add all the spaces. <laughs> uh, is it going to be in square brackets or? Nope. Just just as it's written here. Just um. Press a return key and then paste this yep. after that. Let me actually pop on there and make sure that everything is cool. Because since I have access to that machine, I can make sure that you're not running into any issues. Uh, let me know when you've uh, when you've added that option. I'm getting a problem. Error writing config dot permission denied. Oh, uh, did I'm you sudo? Nano. You need to sudo. Sudo nano. Okay. Yeah. Hence the open with your text editor of choice with sudo. Why is my Vagrant install taking so long? It says it's running. Yeah, it looks like it's fine. Weird. Oh, there we go. It is foobar. Cool. All right, whatever. Uh, Anker, you still having issues? Almost done. Uh, do you know how to do a search in Nano? 
Because if you no, search, I, I just found it. Uh, okay, cool. I actually use Sublime Text, so right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that works. That is probably way easier. <laughs> uh, I like Sublime Text. All right, so once you've done that, don't forget to restart Container D. You have to use that file. Cool, looks good. Oh, no, it says it's been running since eight minutes ago. Did you restart container D or no? Uh, well, actually, like, I, my command line froze several times. So I have to, re, uh, like, SSH into, like, several times. Uh, quite, wait, where in the world are you located? Uh, India. Ah. Okay, this EC2 instance is in Korea, that's why. Yeah, the command line froze several times, so. Got you. Yeah, sorry, man. Uh, I should I should have checked that with you at the beginning because then I would have stood up an EC2 instance in India for you, or rather, maybe not in India. I don't know what zones there are. Um, but, oh, I, yeah, I could have set one up in Mumbai. But, yeah, sorry about that. It's fine. Um, all right, cool. So. Uh, let me know when I'll, I'll just restart it for you because I'm sure you know how to do that. Oh, you did restart it. Okay, cool. All right, so moving forward. Um, all right, now, and Josie, I, I apologize for the delay, but you can join back up again. Um, now let's actually install the control plane. So, uh, Josie, you're actually going to run a different version of this uh, because we are not using container D. So, Josie. Mm -hmm. I'm going to type this in chat to you. I'm going to type the command. Basically, it's the same. It's the same command, but without the CRI socket part. Um, and the reason we use this IP address is for the networking things later, which I will explain when we get to later. So go ahead and copy this and run it. I'm actually going to copy a different version because I'm doing WSL. Hopefully I can get Vagrant growing again too. Oh dear. <laughs> um, oh, rip. Oh, what? Uh, what? Hey? Yeah. Oh. Uh huh. So I have a different error. <laughs> okay, what is your error? Uh, well, some bit similar. Uh, one of my errors is Docker service is not active. So I'm going to try and run what it says, even though Docker was active. Uh, yeah, it keeps saying host is down. Whoa, that's cool. Huh. Mm, yeah. <laughs> That's just lovely. What was the other error again you said? Uh, okay. Docker service is not yet active. Um, running with swap on is not recommended. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, mine are very slightly different. Cool. Okay. Um, Anker, you should work just fine. Um. But we yeah, can okay. come back to this later. Okay. I can just keep watching and seeing what you're doing. Yeah, because I'll need to fix it on mine too, so yeah, yeah. we'll figure it out. All right, so uh, doing this will install the control plane. So all the stuff like Cube API server, etcd, mo, 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 this command installs all that for you, so you're good. Um, and again, I'll cover why we're doing the pod network cider in a bit. Um, and then this cry socket is basically just telling um, 
telling uh, Kubernetes which container runtime we're using. And as we discussed previously, we're using container D. So uh, also, if you run uh, kubedium init, I'm sorry, init dash dash help, uh, you can see all the different options. Uh, there are quite a few, and it does install many different components. Uh, for example, those components that I described earlier is kind of a summary of the components. There's actually a whole bunch more detail going on there um, that you can see here, including certificate generation and management for the for the nodes in the cluster talking to each other securely. But it does all that for you. So now let's move on to the next slide. Um, Ah, oh, crap. So, Anker, if when you ran kubeadm, it should have given you a helpful... Yeah. Um, yeah. So there are some directions for, for using the cluster as a regular issue, user. Um, you can just copy and paste those. Um, you should be good to go with that. So, And then once you've done that, you should be able to do kubectl uh, get namespaces, and you, and you should get some output. Uh, meanwhile, what I'm going to do is I'm going to real quick, I'm going to set up my Vagrant install so that I can follow along with you um, because WSL is kind of kind of jacked up right now. So I'm going to take a couple minutes to catch up. Um, so were you able to get did you copy and paste those uh, directions, Ankur? I'm running a problem into the second command. It's saying the connection to the server localhost 8080 was refused. Did you specify the right host or port? Whoa, that's weird. kubectl uh... apply f canal yaml, that one. Let me take a look real quick. OK. Oh, so I have not, uh... no, no. It's not working. Wait, did I disconnect from? No, I didn't. OK, cool. I have too many damn windows open. This is a mess. Um, well, you said it is or is not working? It's not working right now. OK. Connection was refused. Did you specify the right host and port? Oh. Uh, you sure you ran the command? Yeah. The command that that kubeadm output. Kubeadm should have output some commands for you. The kubeadm init help. No, 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 no. Before that. I don't think so. Uh, let me. Sorry, I'm I'm grabbing my uh, I'm setting up my. Uh, Vagrant, so I can follow along with you. Just a second. And I, I did not make the proper prayers to the demo gods. <laughs> okay. All right. There we go. I can just copy this stuff because I've tested all this and I know this works. And then I just need to update this Toml file. Pseudo vim, paste. Search for options. Found. New line. Enter tabs. System D C group. True. Uh, restart. Container D. And then, all right. So I'm caught up to Yonker. So. I've got my local Vagrant instance running. I'm going to go ahead and run kubeadm. Bro. Yeah, I'm getting the same thing. Oh, that's because, oh, damn it. OK. That's why. All right. Um, sorry, Ankur, give me a moment. 
tell you what, I'm going to set up a new server for you in Mumbai. <laughs> I'll just follow along. Yeah, it's okay. not. It's okay. All right. I'll just keep watching. Ah, uh, yeah, because uh, when I was setting, I was setting all this up on. Um, I probably should have set this up on all three environments, but I only set it up on my vagrant environment because I thought that would be the most difficult. It's okay. I'll just follow the slides. Okay. So, in that case, um, what I should do is. I should paste the output that you'll see. Where is my vagrant window? Yeah, here we go. OK, so this is a working Linux instance. Um, we're doing OK on time still. Yeah, we're almost done. Um, so again, kubedm init, we're doing container D, and then I'll explain this networking stuff in a bit. So we're going to run this. We're going to run this. Oh. What? I just installed it, dude. Oh, that's right, that bug. I still don't know what caused that. Nope. Nope. Where is it? What? I tested the shit out of this yesterday just so that this kind of stuff wouldn't happen, and then it happened anyway. <laughs> okay, there we go. So I'm installing Docker on my Vagrant install, and then we install the tools. I should have just had everyone use Vagrant. That would have been probably easier. All right, and then we're installing kubeadm and kubectl and all that. What? Unable to find package. Bro, I tested this, wait. What? Does not have a release file. I tested this yesterday. Yeah, that looks right. And then that looks right. <laughs> oh, I wonder. Hold up. I did change it to use Oops. What? What the hell? <laughs> That's just great. OK, so all right. Well, yesterday, I had a bug here where this was hard coded as Zenial, but it worked. So I'm going to run with that. But I'm a bit surprised because Josie was able to get through here without a problem. So I don't know what happened. Weird. OK, whatever. We'll just run with it. There we go. That's more of what I'm expecting to see. OK. Cool. All right, so I got kubeadm, kubectl, all that installed. Run through setting up the system very quickly. All good. 
good. I thought I did this part already, but we'll check it just in case. Oh, I th then where the hell did I do this? <laughs> okay. All right, so now, finally, let's install kubeadm, or installed Kubernetes with kubeadm. Here we go. This is what we expect. So what it's doing now is um, it's pulling down the various Docker images that run the different Kubernetes components. So it's basically just doing a Docker pull at this moment. And this is going to take a little bit. Um, it should be pretty fast though, because Korea has badass internet. Um, so this is doing things like installing the Cube API server, installing um, the, the Kubernetes controller manager, the etcd installation, all these kinds of things. And the nice part is that uh, Cube ADM, like I mentioned before, does a lot of this for you. And at the end, it actually tells you how to configure kubectl to interact with your Kubernetes installation. And if you want to add another um, add another node to the Kubernetes cluster, it even gives you the kubeadm command to do that. And you can just copy and paste it. And it makes life way easier. It's just getting to this point is the hard part. <laughs> um, so for what it's worth, um, Make sure that in the future, if you install Kubernetes, you have a machine with at least two CPUs and two gigs of RAM, because uh, that's a problem we ran into today. And while we're waiting for this to run, I'm going to see if I can figure out um, the kubeadm WSL stuff, because that's just annoying and weird. Aha. Okay, Josie, the reason that we were running into issues is because apparently WSL relies on Docker for Windows to do stuff. Oh, no. Yep. So what we need to do is pop over to our settings. Go into I don't have Docker installed. Oof. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll do uh, this for the I'm recording gonna... then. Yeah, I'll watch this later. All right, so interesting because uh, basically Docker, the gear for settings, resources, WSL integration. And then you'll see enable integration with my default WSL distro. However, um, what you and I set up is our WSL default distro. So that's not the problem. Then why? All right, I'm going to get out of this. Man, kubeadm is sure taking its sweet. Oh, OK. So that was cool. Um, this might be because I'm doing Windowsy things. Um, and command prompt is a really shitty uh, shell. But I had to hit Enter for the standard output buffer to flush. <laughs> so that was cool. But I hit enter. I guess it, it shouldn't take as long as it did. It's just because I didn't hit enter yet because the buffer was still locked for some reason. But you'll see that um, kubeadm uh, generated all of our certificate stuff. Again, because the, the Kubernetes APIs internally use certificates to make sure that there's not anything funky happening. Um, and it also sets up local DNS names for, again, for internal networking. Um, you can then see it also sets up the, the API server. It sets up etcd. Um, it sets up uh, the Kubernetes configurations, including the controller manager configurations, because I know you had questions about that, Unker. Um, it also starts up a kubelet, because the controller can also, also does, does need to run um, containers, because that's how the services start. And then. 
Basically, it just sets up all of the configurations in etcd, creates some default configuration. Uh, Kubernetes uses RBAC, role-based access control, um, to do permissions -y stuff. So it sets up all the RBAC rules, and then it sets up the cluster info, and you're good to go. It also adds the add-on core DNS. I mentioned earlier when we were talking about add-ons that uh, kubeadm includes um, DNS for us. So that's core DNS. And uh, the, it installs the kube proxy for some basic pod networking. Now, this is the useful part. And this is what I wanted to copy and paste. Uh, yeah, into here. Oh, boy. OK, so we're going to fix this real quick. But basically, um, that's really annoying. That's super annoying. OK. Uh, Cube ADM will set up, um, or will give you instructions to do a whole bunch of configurations yourself, uh, basically like this. So. Not basically like this, exactly like this. Oh, that's ugly as hell. Let's fix that. Hey. Uh, I'll, I'll format this later. But basically, whoa. Um, you'll see this bit here. Um, remember, we installed kubectl in order to interact with the Kubernetes cluster. So if you basic if kubeadm tell gives you the instructions on how to configure kubectl so that you can run with the cluster. So we're just going to basically copy and paste that. And now that so kubeadm installed the control plane for us. Running those three commands it sets up kubectl for us. So now we can do kubectl get namespaces. And you can see that we're now talking to our new Kubernetes cluster using kubectl. Um, additionally, um, we're going to deploy a pod network, which we'll do in a minute. And I mentioned that kubeadm provides a command for uh, getting adding new nodes to the cluster, because again, you usually don't want a one cluster, a one node cluster, you want multiple. So if you just run this command on your other nodes, and assuming that they have network access to this node, they will add themselves to the cluster like magic. So given that, um, now that we have our our Kubernetes control plane installed, we need to set up our pod networking so that our different um, applications can talk to each other inside Kubernetes. There are a whole bunch of different options, like a whole bunch of different options. But screw all that, I made the choice for you. Um, we're going to install one called Canal, which is actually a combination of two other ones, Flannel and Calico. Uh, ca Flannel is like a super, super basic option, and Calico is like all of the things option. But um, Calico allows you to work with Flannel, and using the two together, they call it Canal. There's a whole bunch of history around the naming. You can go read about it if you want, but I'm not going to waste your time with it. So given that, um, you can basically download the Canal definitions for setting up this network from their website, from the Calico website. So I'm going to go ahead and grab that, if I can copy and paste properly, because Windows is a pain. And you'll see now I, you'll see this canal.yaml, if I take a look at this real quick. This is basically a whole bunch of Kubernetes resources, which I haven't taught you how to define yet. We're going to do that in part two. Um, and in part two, I'll also just set up some virtual machines for you guys to access. They're already set up, so you don't have to deal with all this nonsense. Um, and you can just SSH to them from your computer. Um, but basically, these are all the definitions necessary to set up our pod networking. So what we're going to do is just tell Kubernetes, whoa, tell Kubernetes, hey, do run this. And it's going to basically read that YAML file and set up all of these different um, things that are necessary for pod networking. So having done this, now our different 
applications, when we install them, can talk to each other safely. So there's that. Um, and at this point, you have a functioning cluster. You are good to go. You're ready. Um, if you're on a proper Linux instance and not a crap one like all the ones I set up today, and I apologize for that, um, this should be a relatively smooth process. But let's say we want a UI so that we can manage this and do everything that's happening. We're going to go ahead and install that right now. So um, there's the dashboard UI, which you can see here and gives us a whole bunch of stats about our cluster, which is great because if you can't see what's happening, you can't see any problems and you need to know about problems. So we're going to copy and paste this puppy. And what that's going to do is basically uh, similar to our canal stuff, there's a YAML file which defines all the stuff to run this. Um, you'll find next class that everything is done with YAML and it makes life way easier. Um, so this creates all the stuff necessary for our dashboard. So again, if we do kubectl get namespaces, you'll see this Kubernetes dashboard namespace. And inside that namespace, uh, you can see that the dashboard is being deployed. So we're good to go. Uh, but then how do we see the dashboard, right? This is on, um, that's why for the Vagrant stuff, we did the port forwarding. So what we're going to do is this guy right here. Um, I, get, I mentioned earlier that Kubernetes does role-based access, role access control, or RBAC for short. Um, so there are, are different roles defined within Kubernetes. In this case, we have a you can have role you can have roles at both the entire cluster level or within a namespace. In this case, we're going to define a cluster role called default, um, which is going to give the admin role to the default service account. Now, in production, you do not want to do this. <laughs> this is a bad idea. Do not do this um, because basically it's giving uh, admin rights to any default user, which is not cool. But for purposes of this demonstration, we're going to go ahead and do it. So we create this cluster role. And then uh, in doing so, uh, it gives you a token, uh, basically just a string that you can use as a way to authenticate as this default service account. So to print that, we're going to go ahead and run this command. Basically, it's inside a Kubernetes secret. And you get this big, crazy, long string, and it's a mess, right? Uh, but that string is basically how we log in to do Kubernetes things. So now we're going to do a proxy. Uh, kubectl proxy basically says, because uh, Kubernetes stuff by default is private. Right, it's not exposed to the outside world except for the Cube API. Um, but in this case, we have an application deployed in the cluster that's not exposed externally. Uh, if we want to expose it temporarily, we can use kubectl proxy to create a proxy from the outside in, um, according to whatever configurations you define. So I'm going to go ahead and define a, a Kubernetes proxy to allow us to go through port 8001 into the cluster. So now, uh, if we do something like localhost colon 8001, you'll see this is basically the Kubernetes API. And this is showing me all the different uh, endpoints that I can use to access the API. So I can do something like APIs. And it shows me all the different uh, APIs and how to access them and all that kind of stuff. Pretty cool. Um, however, we want to look at our web dashboard. So uh, to save you a bunch of trouble, you can just copy and paste this link. And this is going through the Kubernetes API to look at the web dashboard. Now, for security purposes, uh, they require either a token or a kube config. In this case, we're going to grab that token that we, that we got from the previous command. We're going to copy and paste that guy. And now we are we have a dashboard for our Kubernetes cluster that we deployed ourselves. So we can do things like look at our pod, or let me change to the default or to all namespaces. So now we can see all of our different 
uh, applications that are deployed, which is mostly our add-ons, like the DNS add-on, like our pod networking, that kind of stuff. Um, we can also see uh, deployments and services. And basically, this is a way to look at Kubernetes using a web UI, which I actually don't recommend a whole lot of the time, but it's useful for purposes of monitoring, which is the, the really nice bit. Uh, speaking of, where is the monitoring stuff? Yeah, here we go. No, that's not quite what I'm looking for. So does this Kubernetes uh, like thing has its own alert system or you use some external thing like Prometheus or mm -hmm. these kind of... You want to use something like Prometheus, yes. But Prometheus was designed to work very well on Kubernetes, so it's not too hard to do. Okay. Um, maybe maybe we can do maybe we can do that for fun actually. Um, let's do because at this point we're pretty much done. Like that's it. That's what I wanted to show you today. But just because we got a couple extra minutes. Oh, I don't have Helm installed. Whatever. No, I want I want to uh, let me install Helm real quick. Or, mm, is that a good idea? Uh, maybe it's not a good idea. Um, tell you what, maybe for uh, well, it does have a web UI. Yeah, let's try it real quick. So there's a tool called Helm which is really helpful for um, deploying Kubernetes things, and which I will teach during the next class. Um, but, whoops, uh, let's go ahead and install Helm real quick. Whoops, let's, uh, yeah, let's kill the proxy. Grab this real quick. Cool. And then unpack it, move it to, yeah, here we go. Cool. And then we can do, fine bro all oh, right that's how it works ha 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 i remember how to do things i promise except i got them in the wrong order maybe this was not a good link to follow Oh, no, that is a good one to follow. Okay, we're gonna do this. And then we can do, oh, geez, let's see. Uh, they're all separate. I just wanna do the whole thing. Yeah, let me just do the whole thing. Ugh. Same mistake twice. So now, just like that, we're installing Prometheus and done question mark? <laughs> yeah, here we go. So we can do something like this. And then you can set up the, it also gives you instructions on how to set up the alert manager. Nope, the pod's, oh, the pod's not ready yet. Um, where is it? Uh, yeah, it's still starting. But basically that's how you can install Prometheus and then you're done, you're good to go. Um, and I'll, I'll cover that in more detail uh, at part two of the class. 
So sorry, that was a very long answer to your question, but it doesn't answer your question. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, why is it still pending? Hold up. Oh. I don't have persist, persistent volumes set up for this. Um, so Prometheus is not going to deploy. Um, but I will have that. We're, we're going to cover that in um, in part two. So yeah, theoretically, if you're on a cloud provider, that would all be automatic. Um, but because it's on-premise and I haven't set up um, a volume claim controller, it's not going to work. Because uh, Prometheus needs persistent storage. In case the pod dies, you don't want to lose all your data, right? Okay. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, basically that's how you set up um, Kubernetes with kubeADM. Uh, basically, you just run after you've done all the necessary setup, you just run kubeADM init um, with whatever configurations. Ah, I forgot to explain this uh, networky bit. Um, Flannel, the pod networking tool, uh, expects your Kubernetes cluster to be running at this. CIDR address, which is usually pretty safe, because who the hell uses 244 as a as a local intranet subnet? Um, but theoretically, you could change this if necessary. And this is also kind of internal to Kubernetes, so there shouldn't be too much danger, but you still want to avoid um, uh, avoid um, network collisions, network subnet collisions. So cool. So sorry that was so rocky. Um, also, if you are, um, if you're running Vagrant, you can do this to shut down things, or if you're running, um, WSL, you can, uh, use these commands to close things up. So Josie, if you want to kill your WSL install for now, you can just follow these directions. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, does, uh, so what I'm going to do is kind of just open things to questions about anything anything kubernetes related and then once all that's answered josie i'm going to try to figure out the wsl stuff if you mm -hmm. want to do it with me so uh would i be able to use that uh what you've just shown to terminate my thing now would would any of that work right now yes uh because it says Command WSL not found. So I'm wondering if there was some uh, stuff that we missed. Uh, this needs to be run in command prompt. Yeah. Uh, like general command yes, prompt? Yes, general not. command prompt, not WSL. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, also, the distro name, when you, when you do WSL list, like like I encountered earlier, um, it'll have space default. That's not actually part of the name. The name is just Ubuntu. <laughs> mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. And it doesn't parse quotes correctly because Microsoft is cool like that. So don't include quotes. <laughs> Salty. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Beach. Yeah, no worries. Um, any other, any questions about uh, what we covered today or what we or questions about what we're going to cover next time, or questions about things in general? No. Wow. That's good. Cool. Yeah, I'm going to have to run as well. So, BG, if you figure it out, can you let me know? Yeah, I'm going to uh, I'm going to figure it out and then update the presentation with WSL stuff, and I'll let you know when all that's done. OK. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank no you. worries. Yeah. Cool. Bye. Well, thank you for coming, guys. Uh, Nietzsche, are you on Twitter? Uh, I have Twitter, but I'm not active on it. Okay. But I can I can share it with you if if you want. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Uh, let me. Actually, wait. What is my Twitter? Is it this? Yeah, that's me. So let me just toss that in here. Um, the best way to communicate with me is um via Discord. So if you uh, if you pop down here, yeah, join that Discord server. Okay, great. Already. Yeah, that's that's going to be the easiest way to get in touch with me. Uh, 
so if uh, and the recommended way is oh okay um, I recommend like if you have questions post them in general and just do an at beach or the beach whatever the hell might the beach yeah yeah because um, a lot of people like to direct message me and I'm like no don't do that because then if someone else has the same problem I have to go answer yeah. them again <laughs> yeah so yeah but cool any any other questions guys when's the next session uh, the next session will be the same time next week so Sunday 4 p.m. okay yep uh, the link will be different though so make sure to check back on meetup or Facebook yeah I guess you should just clean the SSH keys uh, I'm going to generate whole new instances. Yeah. Um, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll just use the same key. Why not? Cool. No, it's it's a good practice to just clean up everything after you've finished. Yeah, but I mean, I'm going to clean it up in a week anyway, and there's not going to be any instances in our AWS after this. Uh, we do clean up after every event, so. But yeah. Cool. And All right. thank you. Yeah, thank you guys, and I will uh, see you next time. Have a nice day. You too. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye. Right.